Hi, good evening. It is March 17th, 2020, and it's about 6.30 p.m. here in New Jersey. From my living room, I am recording uh, another day um, in battle against COVID-19 or coronavirus. I will say that we are learning uh, more and more about the virus as the minutes go on and more about the treatment. Um, even though we still are waiting for randomized trials to teach us exactly what the best cocktail or medication is and dose. Uh, everything that uh, I talk about tonight is, is really off-label, as we do not have uh, any proven medication for COVID-19. There are a lot of suggestions and recommendations that are out there, so uh, for this segment I'd like to talk and concentrate on treatment whether it be prophylaxis or some of the stuff that we're doing for the sicker patients in the ICU. Um, sad to say I do have uh, one confirmed case of COVID-19 by test, PCR, and another, um, actually a physician that is younger than me that um, a, a test is pending on and highly suspicious for. Um, that really, that really kind of hit home. Uh, so uh, we are doing everything in our power and taking all the knowledge and experiences from Asia, Europe, uh, and around the world where uh, they've uh, treated uh, patients, obviously, before the United States and have recommendations and algorithms, and, and it is helpful. Uh, we are also combining those and, and I think, modifying them ourselves. And uh, certainly uh, what I witnessed in, in our ICU today was you know, an amazing display of teamwork and and just everybody helping each other and, of course, uh, staying uh, completely sterile, uh, almost obsessively, I would say. In fact, um, I think uh, uh, one of the residents uh, termed today Purell dermatitis, um, and you can see my hands are, are definitely uh, suffering from, uh, from overwashing, if you will, uh, I think uh, probably overdoing it a bit. But it's better to be safe than sorry and wearing the N95 masks, um, obviously in any COVID room or rule out room uh, with gowns and um, really trying to get in and out of there as quickly as possible but while still you know, fulfilling a physical exam is challenging to say the least. So recommendations as far as prophylaxis, I've heard everything from you know, vitamin C to melatonin today a nurse brought up, uh, sent me an article on that and I'm getting many articles sent to me. Uh, via my uh, my number uh, and email, uh, which those who know me have. Uh, certainly uh, would like to address any other questions and issues out there uh, on future segments. Um, but speaking of vitamin C, I did read uh, something today uh, that the uh, Shanghai or the Chinese government uh, did have some success with high-dose vitamin C in uh, sicker patients, but recommending starting you know somewhere around 4,000 to 16,000 milligrams IV uh, in a patient as soon as possible and uh, suggesting that it may have effects against acute lung injury and ARDS or acute respiratory distress syndrome. Uh, I am considering that uh, tomorrow, uh, depending on how the patients are doing clinically or uh, potentially even thinking about it as a protocol, uh, whether or not to take high dose outpatient uh, oral over the counter vitamin C and, and does it work as well as IV? They're suggesting it doesn't, um, but uh, vitamin C is generally well tolerated and uh, it, it does interact with some medications. Uh, so you should certainly check with your doctor or pharmacist uh, in regards to that if you want to take it. Uh, even saw melatonin uh, recommended at doses between five and 40 milligrams. Again, it does go through the liver, although at low doses appears to be very safe. We use it in our sleep medicine practice for insomnia, although its effects have uh, been pretty weak there. And uh, for um, uh, people that are traveling and jet lag, it's been used at, at low doses for that as well with some success uh, when you're dealing with time zones, and that's well known. Uh, whether or not it's an anti-viral you know, uh, viral or how well it works against COVID uh, is, is debatable. Um, but certainly people are having trouble sleeping. So if you took a five milligram melatonin for your insomnia, who knows, maybe it'll help. Uh, and zinc, of course, uh, we mentioned briefly before, but 50 milligrams BID or twice a day may be helpful uh, as an antiviral in at least um, some common cold 
you know, uh, uh, studies in the past or at least suggestions. Other than that, you know, uh, vitamin D and, 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 you know, other supplements may be helpful. Uh, I'm a big proponent of low dose naltrexone, uh, 4.5 milligrams at night. Been using that for about a decade in cancer patients. Used it on my own, uh, with my own father, um, who had pancreatic cancer in the past, and uh, I believe it prolonged survival. Um, uh, but uh, there is a website for that. Um, you can Google, um, low dose naltrexone and read all about it as far as it's, uh, you know, anti suspected anti cancer effects and studies that have been done at Penn state many years ago at the cellular level. And there is of course, suggestion from a company that has branded it, uh, over in Africa and other parts of the world that it may help in COVID-19. So more to come on low dose naltrexone. We've used naltrexone for heroin addiction and alcohol as a pill at 50 to 100 milligrams, but this would be compounded to work at micro doses where endorphins rise and immune system, system may boost. My 5 methylencephalin is the uh, known player with endorphin, uh, and those proteins may, uh, in a higher you know levels, be protective in general. Old studies with breast cancer and exercise, the endorphins seem to help a bit. So who knows with uh, low dose naltrexone? But I'm a proponent of it. And I would check out that website at some point. I have no disclosure there. But uh, what about the heavy uh, hitter medications that have been studied around the world? Aside from the vitamin C I mentioned in a high dose, 4,000 to 16,000 milligram dose, uh, we did apply for compassionate use on one patient who is on uh, a mechanical ventilator and remstelvimir, R-E-M-S-T-E-L-V-E-M-I-R, is the generic um, made by Gilead uh, uh, pharmaceuticals, I believe, and they're in uh, compassionate use. It is not FDA approved. It is only for compassionate use, clearly off label. And you have to fill out an application that uh, goes through the company, which uh, I did today with our pharmacist, Michelle. And uh, hopefully we will get uh, that medication for our respiratory failure patient. You do need uh, to have a positive test for COVID-19 and be on a mechanical ventilator in order to apply for that compassionate use, which they still are offering for providers out there in ICU's uh, Gilead uh, website has that information. Um, we also ordered for two patients uh, toclizumab, uh, and that is a interleukin-6 inhibitor, anti-IL-6, a protein um, uh, thought to have inflammatory responses to that protein. This is against that protein and it's used in the rheumatology world. In our asthma world, we use IL-5 inhibitors uh, for allergic and eosinophilic asthma to wipe out eosinophils. Uh, this is uh, sort of along those lines in regards to biologics, but this is the interleukin-6 that it's messing with. And it seems to, uh, uh, we're getting reports around the world, including, in, including the United States, that it is uh, helping pull some people out of acute respiratory distress, or at least it seems that way. So there are, um, uh, there is an algorithm for using that as well, which is supposed to come after remstelvimir. However, uh, when there's a wait to get that through the compassionate, uh, we are uh, just going right to the IL-6 inhibitor and the more severe patient in the ICU and two are up for, uh, up to bat for that. Uh, and there is another one, Sarilumab, S-A-R-I-L-U-M-A-B, which is similar, IL-6, and there's some experience with that. They have brand names as well, but... Uh, really, uh, that's for the critical care, uh, infectious disease teams that are t caring for these patients on the front lines. And um, we are aggressive with them because the side effect profile seems to be very low. Uh, everybody's coming in on hydroxychloroquine. Uh, we're, we're putting them on that right away as a rule out with bilateral pneumonia. And that's brand name is Plaquenil, also used in the rheumatology world for lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. I mentioned on the previous, and we're giving 400 milligrams twice a day on uh, in that regards. The IL-6, I believe, was a 500 milligram IV dose, and it does come in subcutaneous shots that outpatient rheumatoid patients are on. However, um, we did check with the pharmacy, and it's not so easy, and they're lower doses to just get that into an IV, so it does have to be ordered through vials and mixed up by pharmacy. Hydroxychloroquine is a pill, and I, I suspect there'll be a, a national shortage, or already is, and we may be shifted to chloroquine or other similar anti-malarials uh, that we take prophylactically when we go to uh, places where uh, there's malaria. 
So a lot going on there, and we're aggressive with it, along with supportive care. Again, we're avoiding non-steroidal anti-inflammatories and steroids. I think that's an important point, unless you know, you're kind of desperate and they're having exacerbations of underlying lung processes and you can't oxygenate or ventilate them, then of course we would um, have to give some, but like influenza, we're, we're avoiding the steroids, some papers and outcomes looking worse in that regards. Um, so we talked about prophylaxis and we talked about the treatments going on in ICUs and there's probably more to learn tomorrow. Uh, let's uh, get through this week. Um, I am two days out of seven. Uh, straight in the ICU. So um, hope to report back that everybody's doing well and testing. Uh, we will talk about in tomorrow's segment because uh, that's changing overnight as a um, prelude to that. You know, we are waiting on five, six patients uh, in the ICU on tests that were done days ago, and we are giving them hydroxychloroquine and other medications that we, you know, are going to run out of so really, it's important that we get that 24-hour, 48-hour test immediately. And, and I heard that hopefully by tomorrow, we will have a rapid testing, more rapid testing, and get answers within a day or two. And then with outpatient uh, urgent care setting up uh, to do rapid testing, check with your local urgent cares. Uh, but we don't want to inundate them with unnecessary uh, uh, tests. Uh, so if you are symptomatic or truly concerned or had contact, then that would be a probably a, a release valve for e emergency rooms uh, who are uh, getting hit hard too. Uh, and as testing increases, so will the numbers. And I suspect the mortality rates will actually come down as we dilute out uh, with you know hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of tests being done, uh, where the U.S. population should do as well as the uh, uh, other countries that are reporting very low mortality rates, which is a good thing. So everybody, again, stay safe, and we'll be back tomorrow with more. This was a, a double segment tonight uh, on treatment for COVID-19. Uh, Jeff Miskoff, uh, Dr. Miskoff signing out, and uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Be well.